Um, we're very fortunate to have visiting uh, with us uh, a uh, group of uh, uh, companies and uh, researchers from the UK. We've been cultivating a relationship uh, across the Atlantic between Canada and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the UK, uh, particularly in the area of agri-tech. And uh, uh, fortunately, uh, this conference also coincided with the visit uh, from Innovate UK. And so I'm going to call upon Tom Jenkins to join us on the stage, who is uh, um, the Agricultural Director for Innovate UK. Um, and we will have a series of uh, short presentations, or uh, I sometimes call them extended elevator pitches from some of our visiting companies. So uh, um, if the, uh, the uh, representatives would like to come onto the chairs here, then uh, we will call you up individually. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Tom to actually introduce the, uh, uh, the company representatives here. Thanks very much, Morris, and thanks again for helping to integrate us into the programme. It's really appreciated. Yes, I'm from Innovate UK, so we're a, pu well, we're a public sector funder in the UK. Our primary customer base is the commercial sector, so we use funding, typically grant funding, to help de-risk innovations, so to bring together project flow to try and get new products and services to the marketplace to benefit the UK economy. And we've been funding in a dedicated way since about 2010 the agri-tech sector. And we're going to hear from a subset of some companies we've taken across to try and build upon those domestic investments and see where we believe there could be opportunities to extend collaborations internationally and building on some work that we've been doing with Canada um, last year and this year again. So we've got a subset, as I say, of these companies, but if anyone's interested, there are some brochures which just give a bit of an overview of the others that we've brought along. It's quite a, a broad range of sectors, so we go right the way across from plants to livestock as well, and a range of different approaches into things like biopesticides and other interventions to try and improve production efficiency. But I think the format we're going to take now is we're going to have relatively short, punchy overviews from the UK delegation. Um, and the first one who's going to be speaking for us is Jason hawkins Row from a company called Aponic Limited. And they're looking at um, vertical farming. They've got technology which is quite innovative and it's been applied across a range of different crops, so not just the more typical suspects like the leafy, high-value salad type crops. And so I'll, I'll hand over to Jason who'll talk you through that and then we'll move through the group. So Jason, the floor's yours. Hi, my name is Jason Hawkins Rowe. My company is called Aponic. We're a vertical um, aeroponic farming system. Um, and we've often found ourselves in the same room as probably a lot of you guys. When we're all talking about 2050 and 9.8 billion people. And it's a pretty scary prospect with climate change and, and the realities of sustainable um, intensification of agriculture looking um, a little bit um, difficult to do. Also, people are worried about food security and safety. So. We sort of put a, a, a wish list together, as it were. So we were looking to grow faster um, in, in general terms. We we're looking for larger yields, but we we're looking also to grow uh, using less inputs, which was pretty much the original brief for GMO. Um, and we looked at that also as a, if you're going to grow sustainably, you've also got to create a sustainable business model. To do that, you've got to take the variables out of farming, because it's the variables that cost farmers the money. Um, so that can be climate, it can be seasonal, it can be pathogens or, or um, herbicide resistance, whatever that might be, but we need to get a good handle on those, on those variables. So we, we're looking to also grow using less fertilizer, having no runoff, um, taking away the, the, you know, a, a system where taking away all these crops and crop protections that are, that are becoming um, very resistant or the, the targets are becoming very resistant. So we're also looking then to make it a relevant diversification for farmers so that they can have something which is, a, which is a, an alternative that is in their core market. So they know what to do and how to do it, but we're just presenting it in a different way that makes them a bit more money. And that's where we're looking to take those barriers away from, from farming so that you don't have to have um, 
been born with a whole lot of land, you can actually start from what you've got, where you are, and create export quality food. So to do that, you've got to increase the margins. You've got to um, you've got to reduce the labour costs. You've got to make the cost of sale a lot cheaper. So all of those things we were looking at when we were thinking about the system. And we spent six years in R&D. It's a UK patented product. We manufacture in the UK. We've got several successful commercial trials now under our belts. And we're still 100% owned by our founders, which is kind of difficult. Um, so what we came up with was this. And this is a very short version of it. It's suffered a bit in the, in the, in the flight WestJet. <laughs> um, so it's a vertical system, which means that it's very space efficient. You're turning your acreage into volume. The plants sit in the front of this unit with the roots in the void in the back box there. So what we're doing is just spraying the root with a nutrient mix for 10 seconds every 20 minutes. And that gives the plant all the water and nutrient it wants, but it also allows a lot of oxygen to absorb at the root. So once you're doing that, the oils and sugars are forming far more efficiently in the plant. You're seeing that faster growth. We're getting around about 30% faster growth. We're getting about 30% bigger yields. And because it's a recycling system, the water that isn't taken up goes back out the bottom, back into the reservoir. So we're using 90% less water than you would do just pouring it on the ground. Um, because it's soilless, there are no weeds, only what you plant in there grows. So you're never, never using any, pest, any herbicides. Um, recycling means you're saving all that water, but it also means you're saving the nutrient. You're not getting the, the nutrient runoff into, the, into the, the environment, so it doesn't affect biodiversification. It's a very low power system because you're spraying for 10 seconds every 20 minutes. You're using 18 minutes of energy a day. It's a 12 volt system, so this will run happily on a bucket of water and a solar panel and a car battery off grid anywhere in the world. It's needed to be scalable, so whatever you can grow in one of these tubes, you can repeat absolutely um, as many times as you want to. So you can grow the same thing in 100,000 tubes and get exactly the same results. So that consistency is there, which is important for the onward market. So when you're using less water, less chemicals, and getting higher yield, that's pretty much sustainable. That's where we were heading there. And the, the inputs are very much lower because we're not having to use any fuel to turn soil. We're, not, we're using mostly renewable fuel, to, renewable energies to um, actually create the growing. And then we're also taking off waste products from other processes. So in the winter, we can use excess heat and CO2 from heating systems that's being produced all the time and very often just pumped out into the atmosphere. So to do that, we had to create our own remote control and support system, which is an IoT system. It runs the heat, the light, the temperature, the, the, uh, the nutrient values, the pH values. So it runs the whole show. But that means that we can actually um, look into that from anywhere in the world and monitor it and give support where it's needed. But that means that we can grow in greenhouses, warehouses, um, urban farms and container farms. But the very important part about that is we're gathering a lot of really important data. It's not big data because we don't need big data. We want really good, precise data that we can use. Um, so within that data, you know the seed origin, the, the nutrient profile right without the grow, um, the quantity, the location, the grower profile, anything that is used during that grow is, is logged. So for the farmers, you're getting a, a supported system, which is low input, high value output. It's a lot less labor involved. Um, so you're creating higher profit areas on the farm out of, out of perhaps buildings that are only used for storing rusty machinery for the last 30 years. It can suddenly become a very high profit area of your farm. So that data is very important. If we can aggregate that off, that can go straight to buyers. So they know what's growing. They know when it's coming off. They've now got a consistent supply, which they can choose a local location to go straight into their hubs. And then all of a sudden, they've got much longer shelf life. They've got a much better tasting crop because the oils and sugars are there. Um, so the buyers are, are, have got a lot less at, of uh, logistics chain to actually deal with. But it also means that what they're actually looking at is something which arguably is, is above organic standard. You know, and organic has done a really good job for a lot of years, but what it isn't proving to be is sustainable. And we've got to be looking at that aspect as well as the organic system. So what can we grow? Well, any of these items of what we grow, we've always headed away from, from lettuce and tomatoes, although we can grow them perfectly well. It bores me. So 
we were, we were going straight into looking at chilies. We were looking at um, peas and beans and potatoes. We were, we were trying to get you know, some interesting salad crops. And, and with herbs, we can increase their yield of oil or, or whatever you're looking for as a deliverable just by stressing the plant differently. And what we're doing here isn't precision growing, but it's normally precision stress. So we can change the temperature of the root. We can, we can um, change the light patterns. We can change the water patterns. So all of these will be triggers for the plants to do different things. It gives us a whole range of new, um, new possibilities for the plants. We're looking at a lot of raw materials. So hemp and cotton have been amazing for fiber. But the cotton industry is 7% of the world's agriculture and I think 40% of the world's pesticide. So if we can take that, put it in biosecure areas, we're not using so much expensive pesticide, we're not getting the resistance, and we're not pumping that stuff into the food chain. There's also the, the medical side, so we've got, um, ca um, well, cannabis is, is an, an amazing product for, for the pharmaceutical industry. And they, somebody was saying the other day that I'd found it in, in a rainforest 10 years ago, it would be hailed as a wonder drug. But it's, you know, it's something that's coming up um, remarkably in, in just pure trade terms at the moment as well. And things like the daffodils were for galanthium, so we're growing that for people with Alzheimer's. So this is an Alzheimer's treatment, comes from the root, and normally these uh, daffodils are planted on top of mountain ranges in England, so they get blown around a lot, so it's just the roots. And we can actually put a, an ultrasonic bar down the back of the root and give it as much or as little root stress as we want, and it consistently creates very, very pure galanthium. So what does it look like in practice? Well, this is actually something we did put together as a model for pepper growing in, in California. So in the same footprint, or in, in half the footprint, we can grow the same amount of plants. We were getting at least four harvests a year. We were getting 25% um, more fruit weight in the same season. We could actually get a lot more than that if we just um, push, that, push the, a few of the buttons again. So where are we going with this? Well, this is actually a, a 6,000 plant prosumer unit. It's 13 by 6. It's got solar panels on the roof, so it will generate its own power. It collects its own rainwater off the roof, filters that, and puts it back into the system. So you've, even if you don't plant, plant this, you've generally got a feed-in tariff, so you're creating an income directly just from the roof. But this can, is perfectly capable of going off-grid anywhere in the world, just being dropped as a whole working unit. So that's where we are at the moment. We're um, here just to, to try and find people that are looking for a meaningful diversification for the farming industry here, something perhaps that they can do in the winter time, and something perhaps that can fulfill a lot of other and open up new markets. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much, Jason. I think just in the interest of time, we're going to try and rattle through these presentations because we lost a little bit earlier on, and I think we need to finish the session about a quarter to 12, and we've got another speaker afterwards as well. Um, sorry about the, the kit getting knocked on WestJet. I hope the complimentary pretzels and water went some way towards um, accommodating you for that. But we'll move straight on now to um, Arthur Soames, who's from a company called Hummingbird Technologies. They're an AI company that are looking at a range of different interventions to give advice to growers moving towards a bit of a pre precision farming type paradigm. So I'll hand over to Arthur now and we'll, we'll keep moving on. Over to you, Arthur. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm going to be as brief as I can. So it's been really interesting listening to um, uh, all the speakers we've had this morning, and especially, um, particularly Steve, earlier on and his team. Um, we've come to, uh, to the same um, uh, project as Steve, but from a slightly different angle. Um, we came from a, a small farming background in the UK, and um, a couple of years ago, in the end of 2016, uh, about sort of harvest time, I remember we, there was a small farm in the Cotswolds, and we wondered if there was a better way of making farming decisions. We wondered if, instead of driving along your Land Rover, standing on the roof and going like that, we wondered if there was a better way. We've, at that time, drone technology, machine learning, and the imagery, crucially, that we required, we're all coming together in a really potent mix. And since then, uh, 
Hummingbird has grown into a company that is now with 23 people. We have 18 computer scientists based in our, uh, in our base in London. And we have flown over 150,000 hectares in over 10,000 flights. We operate uh, all over the world, and we just finished our Series A uh, funding round that was oversubscribed with grants from the ESA um, uh, and uh, investment from the likes of Horizon and, uh, and Downing um, uh, Ventures into our business. Now, what do we do? We uh, analyze data. That's what we are. We're a machine learning business. Um, we analyze data predominantly from UAVs, but also from planes and from uh, satellites. Uh, with the aim of helping farmers make better decisions. Now, uh, our understanding, and, and if you go to any of these trade shows, if you were a farmer, I would be tearing my hair out um, because I'm being pulled from pillar to post. I'm being told I need to buy this new piece of kit and I need to go and invest in this new computer software system. And the problem is, farmers just need like actionable, usable data. And that's what we aim to give them. So we go and uh, can give them variable rate nitrogen maps that will allow them to spray the nitrogen where it's required on their fields. We will give them variable rate uh, PGR, desiccation maps. We can help them count the number of um, uh, potatoes in their field to help them predict their yields in the future. We can help them make better decisions. We can help them reduce their inputs. We can help them increase their yields. And we can help them reduce their ecological footprint. In the days, certainly in the, over the other side of the pond, um, where people are really starting to push back on, on the use of, of, of harmful pesticides and herbicides, we feel that farmers and, and growers and anybody actually who associates themselves with the, with the food industry is really going to have to make an effort to prove that they are only using these drugs when they're required. And I believe in, in, in years to come, people will think it's an absolute fallacy that somebody will blanket spray a field. Let's, let's, let's think about how we can prescribe um, uh, herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers to the plants themselves. So at the moment, we're working on some really interesting uh, technology that can then, using convoluted neural networks, can actually identify individual weeds in a field and come back and tell you exactly how many are there and, crucially, what you can do about it. We're here, we believe that our routes to market are not only through growers themselves, but actually through agronomists who want to um, uh, differentiate themselves from, from their competition. Uh, they could probably do this from the comfort of their bedroom, actually, considering that this all comes straight onto a mobile phone app and onto their own computer. Um, compare that with crop walking, we can, we can cover um, 500 to 1,000 hectares a day with a drone, um, an agronomist will have some pretty sore feet after that. Bear in mind as well that we're looking not only in the uh, visual spectrum, but in the non-visual infrared spectrum, which links in a lot to what um, uh, Steve and his team are doing here in Saskatchewan. Now, we believe that this is a vast global opportunity, um, and um, our platform can be used anywhere in the world. I'm afraid that's a bit, um, uh, a bit skew -if. Here we have just a, a number of examples of the, of the mats we use, and we believe that this is a vast global opportunity. Now, these are the countries we operate in at the moment, um, and I believe, actually, if I can use the laser thing, there's a tiny little bit just here, which we think might become a very good stepping stone for the future. Okay, so please, um, thank you for listening. Um, I, we really believe that this is something that can uh, help farmers, it can help agronomists, it can help um, those who buy from farmers um, make better decisions throughout the growing process. Thank you very much indeed. That's great, thank you very much, um, Arthur. So we're looking forward to cocktails in Cancun as the rest of Saskatchewan farmers get on with it. So it sounds like a, a nice vision for the future. I'd next like to introduce Ruth Basto, who's here representing one of the four agritech centres that we've created in the UK through investment through agritech strategy. That was 80 plus million, mainly in infrastructure and capability, but Ruth's also going to touch on the other four centres. But the one that she's representing is Crop Health and Protection, which has got a centre close to York um, in the UK. So I'll hand over to you now, Ruth, and we'll hear more about chat and the other centres. Thank you.
Thanks, Tom. And as we heard from uh, Morris this morning, agricultural innovation is obviously huge here in Canada, and it's the same true in, in the UK. And there was a review by the UK government in 2013 that led to our agritech strategy. And a part of that was to invest, actually, to try and think about, we had a great fundamental R&D base in the UK, but that's always not being pulled through to actually have impact in the field. So we're thinking about how we might bridge that gap between the great research we have, but also how we can get innovation out there. And the ways that we've done this are trying to think about areas we can invest in, and that includes the Agritech Catalyst. I think there was about 70 million invested in 126 projects. But what I want to talk to you about are actually the Agritech um, centres, and these are centres for agricultural innovation. And these have been a unique collaboration between academia, government, and industry. And the idea here is that we're driving greater um, efficiency, resilience, and wealth across the agri-food centre. So there's been about 90 million invested so far. And as I said, the idea here is to take our great UK R&D base and actually build new infrastructures that are required by industry, but may have not already been invested due to the risk that was um, seen there. And we're trying to find ways now at which we can now drive innovation through to the field through our facilities. So these centres are actually acting as catalysts for change within the industry and the R&D base, and we're finding that there are ways to actually act as gateways for businesses to actually come and find the best scientific expertise in the UK, and that could be businesses from all around the world. And what we're trying to do there is drive research and also think about how we can get more technology into the agri-food sector. So there are four centres that are across the UK, each of them with research and industry partners, each of them a different flavour and a different focus. So the one that I come from is crop hot, um, soil and health and protection, and we're really interested in enhancing and boosting crop performance and productivity. We're looking at that due to the soil, but also biotic and abiotic stresses in ways and numerous ways and through a number of different facilities. There's also AgriEpi, and I have my colleague Palmjit, who's in the front row here, and they're looking at engineering precision technology, so a lot of what you heard this morning is relevant to that, and they're looking at how we can actually get these technologies into the field to really help farmers and growers. Then we also have our centre in livestock, which is actually looking at also productivity and welfare, and really thinking about how the sector can be a UK leader, and you'll hear some about those sectors growth from Douglas at the end. And also we have also a one centre that's all about big data, so really linking to what Morris was talking about this morning, how we look at AI, machine learning, in the same way that you've also heard out from Arthur, and really looking about how we can get this out to make sure we produce really good sustainable food. So I'm from the crop health and protection, and we're really thinking about how we can deliver and move these areas forward in the UK, but also for the world in general. So our mission and objectives at the centre are really looking at how we get these industry and research partnerships together. So we want to take those innovations from the lab, pull them through to the farm and also into the supply chain. So what we're really focusing on is the sustainable intensification, so more with less. We're trying to speed up the development and make sure that people actually adopt these technologies. So you also heard about from Morris about what we're thinking about the social side, social sciences, how people pull these through. We're very interested in that as well. And what we're trying to do is then promote collaboration across the UK research base, but also the great stuff I've heard today. I was really interested in the L systems modelling we've heard about and how that might help us do some of the pesticide and new biological control modelling. And then we're trying to think about what's the translational research aspect of that but always with this focus on sustainable uh, agricultural productivity. So I just wanted to talk to you about a few of the, um, we have a lot of facilities across the UK, and I was trying to think about a few that are relevant here. So we have one which is looking at smart farming technologies, so actually looking at um, real-time data analysis on the farms. Actually, we've got spore capture devices out in the numerous fields across the UK. We can capture spores in the field, figure out what they are, and then use these to help farmers make accurate decisions. So we upload this data to the cloud, we couple that then with weather, and then we can actually say to someone, I've seen Septoria in the field, I know you've got a wet weather forecast for the next couple of days, it's dry today, go out and spray. And if you think about it, you could actually then link this up with farm data, historical data, and you can also then link that up with soil data and what might have been grown in the crop rotation, you can really think about the sort of modeling we might do in the future to really think about improving pests and diseases. We also have our soil science unit, and then we're thinking about using a Lemnitech phenotyping system, which links to a lot of the things that you've also heard today. So if you want to get in contact with us, you can see about the Agritech centres, and you can also see my email down there. Thank you very much.
That's great. Many thanks, Ruth. And finally, I'd like to hand over to Douglas Armstrong from Ice Robotics. So we're taking um, a bit of a, a link from what Ruth was describing in the, the breadth of the agri-tech centres and sectors. So Douglas is looking at um, a range of monitoring devices in the, the livestock industry. And again, that allows um, better decision making to, to drive productivity and efficiency gains in farming. So we'll hear a bit more from Douglas on Ice Robotics and their product portfolio and pipeline. So over to you, Douglas. Okay, thanks very much, Tom. Thanks very much, Morris. Uh, we're really, really pleased to be here, and, th and thanks for organising the trip. Um, as Tom said, uh, I'm going to ring the changes here because we're going to talk about cows. We're not going to talk about plants. Um, uh, I uh, uh, have the privilege of running a company called Ice Robotics, um, and we have a, a, a product which is focused on the dairy industry. But it, it, a lot of this is applicable to all the livestock, and a lot of the thought processes that go behind the, the system are actually applicable across the whole of agriculture. So how do we get this to work? Yeah, here we go. So Ice Robotics, uh, we're a bit long in the tooth now. We're, we've been at this since 2002. We're one of the pioneers in animal behavior monitoring, uh, which is really trying to digitize what good stockmen see. Um, we're based in South Queens Ferry. Those who have been to Scotland will uh, recognize the iconic bridge uh, and have the pleasure of my office looking straight out over onto the top of the bridge. Uh, we have a team of 28, well, we're up to 28 people now, six nationalities, so we're looking for people around the world who are experts in what they do. Uh, we're a commercial organization, uh, but uh, it would be very easy to say, let's go and make some money. But in fact, we've taken an opposite opinion and said, right, what we want to do here is develop our concept. So half of our revenue goes into R&D. Uh, and half of our team, over half of our team, uh, are, uh, are researchers and scientists, multidisciplinary. So we've got animal scientists, we've got computer experts, we've got machine learning people, we've got a vast array of really talented people. Uh, <clears throat> what do we do? Well, we do develop the first accelerometer-based system for monitoring animal behavior, uh, and that was a, the, the, the sort of green device is our first go at it. That's developed into what we call the ice tag, uh, ice tag is now the sort of bread and butter device for animal researchers around the world. It's a gold standard. Uh, we supply 83 research centers globally. Uh, so uh, we have a very, very strong connection with uh, the global uh, research community. Very, very keen, very experienced at working with researchers. So we not only like to sell equipment to them, but we love working with them. Uh, and out of that, we've generated about 120 peer-reviewed papers. So we're really interested in the science behind this. We're not interested in gimmicks. Um, from all the knowledge and, uh, over this period of time, we developed a product which we call CowAlert, and that's a commercial product for dairy farmers. These are some of the companies that we work with. So we're, we're, we're well connected throughout the world and well connected within the industry. So CowAlert, it's really research into practice. That's what we're about. Uh, and it's all very well walking onto a farm with great ideas, but at the end of the day, you have to have four things. You have to have something that's accurate. They're not interested in a lot of rubbish. It has to be relevant, because they're not interested in things that are irrelevant. Uh, it's got to help them run their business. It's got to be simple. They just want the answer. Uh, and it's got to be reliable. If it doesn't work every day, they're not interested. <clears throat> so our focus is on the main economic losses in the farm. So these sort of transcend uh, uh, all the, the nationalities and the, the geography. Fertility, lameness of the, the chestnuts, mastitis as well. But increasingly and very rapidly coming to center stage is animal welfare. Uh, you know, even in, in America now, you know, where, where you generally say that wasn't high on the list of priorities, it's center stage. It is a really, really important thing. People are very happy to have animal products, but they want to make sure that they, the products that they're, they're consuming don't come at the expense of welfare. The system, we put a sensor on the back leg of a cow. Uh, everybody says, well, why do you put it in the back leg? Well, we put it in places that cows didn't really know existed. Uh, and we've come to the conclusion, the back leg's the place to be. Uh, uh, um, so we're collecting data four times a second. So it's, it's high granularity material. Uh, we're taking that data, we transfer it to the cloud, and we're unique in that we store that data in the cloud permanently. So we can go back to the first cow that was in Cow Alert and look at her data. 
That gives us accumulated at the moment, we've got a cumulative data, data source of about 70 million cow days. So we've got 70 million cow days of data sitting in the cloud. <clears throat> we then run our analytics in the cloud, which is great, but it not only allows you to have live information, but it allows you to historic, go back and look at the history, look at risk retrospective, uh, uh, what's happening retrospectively. And that, again, is a hugely powerful tool. So we work in the main sort of in the UK, uh, we work in uh, around the world, uh, we, we uh, work very closely with our research uh, partners and they are giving us bridges and, and links into the commercial dairy industry. So obviously our, our market is the main commercial dairy herds, but we're, doing, we're involved in a really, really interesting project in Kenya now where we're using this technology on small, cow, small numbers of cows, so one or two cows. So we've got to a point now where a guy can put his, his, uh, a device in a cow, uh, the reader's in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the village, the cow phones up the guy with the bull and the bull comes along to the guy without anybody talking to anybody. So it's, it's quite powerful, and it's not only powerful in, the, in developed, uh, not only powerful in the, in the sort of developed dairying industry, but it's actually really, really got big applications in, in remote areas. What are we measuring? Well, it's pretty simple. We measure when the cow is lying down, we measure when she's standing up, and we measure the number of steps she takes. Then we run an algorithm that tells you what her basic motion is, so it gives you some sort of feel for her behavior. Uh, and what we're doing is we're mo monitoring her behavior, not only against her group, but against herself. So if, we're, if we get a significant change in behavior, that alerts, uh, and then we can refine that. So simple things that you can tell uh, when she's in heat. So whenever she's in heat, she's not really interested in anything else. She's dancing around the place looking for a mate. Lying time goes down, number of steps go through the roof. If she's got sore feet, all the things happen. Not really interested in walking around anymore, so she lies down. Um, and her steps go down and the number of lying bites go up. So we can, we can predict a lot of things from, from the information that we're getting. So how do, we, how do we use this on farm? Well, heat detection is a big one. It's obvious, a lot of people can do it, but our system's really, really accurate. It's about 85% on a progesterone test, which those not uh, in the business will know is quite high. Gives the timing, very, very accurate timing. The system self-calibrating, so, so uh, the system learns about the individual cow and her general behavior. So whenever you change your environment or you change things uh, during the day, within about five or, six five or six days, the system's up and running and, and knows what's going on again. Because it's a cloud-based system, we can adjust it. So if it's a grazing herd, we can adjust the sensitivity. If we're in working in you know, places like New Mexico where it's really, really hot, we can accommodate heat stress. Uh, we can work in different herds and different breeds. Uh, we then, the exciting part of this is we then bring in background information. So if we know, if we know when the cow calved, then we can tell you uh, wh uh, which one to serve or which one not to serve. We can also flick up fertility problems, so we can tell you whether a cow is cycling irregularly or cycling too long. Uh, so it's not only then just telling you when she's ready to serve, it'll tell you who to serve and who's got the problems. Lying time, hugely important. Um, we could spend the whole conference talking about lying time. Uh, <clears throat> but basically, a cow wants to lie down in preference to anything else. That's what it does. It lies down. It lies down and it eats. But it does some socializing. It does mating. It does a few other things. But lying time is a key component of a da daily diary of a cow. So um, you can see in this particular herd, the average herd lying time is 10 hours. Uh, we reckon about a one hour's lying time is equivalent to 5% milk. So uh, you get five, one hour line more, more lying time, in the UK that's worth about 150 pounds on a lactation, which is quite important. So generally speaking, cows want to lie down 10 to 14 hours. It's, it's a good, good number. So what's more important though is the distribution. So you can see here, uh, you know, if you've got one foot in a bucket of ice water and one foot in the bottom of bucket of boiling water, on average you're not feeling okay. So here we're looking at the outliers. We're interested in who's lying down for a long period of time and who's not lying down at all. So then you have a bit of detective work to do. So if you look at the seven that are lying down for four to six hours, what's going on here? They could be sick, it could be overcrowding, you're overstocked, bullying, 
So they, they're very sociable animals, so, so they have a pecking order. If you move one, group, one cow to a new group, from one group to the other, there's a, whole, there's a whole period of time where that group has to settle down again. There's cow comfort issues, so what, what, is the cubicle big enough, is the cubicle not big enough, uh, what are we lying on? A whole range of issues, environment, and all of these things are questions that, that the farmer needs to ask himself. And more and more and more, we're automating these. As we get our knowledge together in this, we can automate and tell the farmer what actually could be the problem. Cows have a lying time curve. So before they calve, they lie for maybe 13 hours. Whenever they calve peak lactation, they're lying for three hours less, and then they come back uh, up again. <clears throat> the next thing that we do is lameness alerting. This is a product unique to us, launched last year with uh, help from Innovate. That was a big project that we finished with Innovate funding uh, last year, and lameness was one of the big elements that came out of that. Uh, lameness is a major welfare issue. In the UK, 20 to 30 percent of the dairy cows are lame uh, at any one time. The big problem is that most farmers don't even notice it. Um, when a cow is lame, it's in pain, uh, and it, uh, it, it you know, could be there for three months. It's a major cost issue, so, so these are things that we need to, this is an area that needs to be fixed and sorted out. So our, the whole purpose of the exercise is early detection. We give the cow a lameness uh, probability uh, every day, and from that we can work out alerts and, and who needs to be looked at and who doesn't. And we can give a herd overview, so you can see you can see cows with with uh, herds with with good lameness and, and bad lameness. So it's a modular system. Uh, brings benefits to the farm by integrating more on the farm. Uh, we can increase the power of it, so the farmer himself benefits. But increasingly, they want to share and compare. So if you collect connect a lot of farms to this data, and we're doing that already. Uh, the farmer can share that, so he can share it with his, with his own advisors, but also he can share it with nutritionalists, consultants, and more and more importantly now, processors and the retailer. So a retailer can actually go in and monitor the welfare standard of any farm. And then we connect international groups, and that's really important, and that comes from our research connections. Where next? Well, we're working on a health and, health and welfare index. And these are just some of the farms. This is a farm in Texas. If you think you've had a bad day, just look at this poor girl. She's just pregnancy tested 600 cows. That's in New Mexico. Uh, Texas again, Colorado, and we're doing a lot of work in calves. There you go. Thanks very much, Douglas. And if you could just join me in thanking the group again for their presentations. Well done, everybody. Thank you.